Welcome to worship. Our experience of worship is endlessly varied because we come to each act of worship, each time of worship, from a different place in our lives. We aren't where we were last week. Our circumstances are different and we feel differently about them. We rejoice in different things. We struggle with different things. And the balance between struggling and rejoicing, coping easily and just hanging on, well, that changes too from week to week. But we come from this change and flux to an encounter with God in which certain things are constant. We come seeking acceptance and we are accepted. We come seeking forgiveness and we are forgiven. We come bringing the brokenness of our lives and find healing. We come bringing the brokenness of the world and we find hope. We come to the God who is constant, not because God never changes, but because God is always possibility and renewal. We bring things that seem beyond repair, situations that seem beyond mending, limitations that we just can't transcend. But God is God. And what is on pass and limit and impossibility with us is none of these things with God. Welcome to worship. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let us worship God.
let us pray. Strong, powerful God, loving, gentle God, we confess that we have such strange notions of strength and power, of gentleness and even love. It's as though we learned of these things apart from you and then we tried to make you fit our conceptions. We do that all the time and we are sorry. Lord, have mercy on us. Jesus taught us that infinite power and infinite gentleness, unsearchable justice and inexhaustible grace come together in the mystery of your being. For God is love. Yet we are complicit in a world in which raucous might and crude aggression, greed, injustice and hate all claim and wear the mantle of power and shape the lives of millions. Christ, have mercy on us. We bring you a world that is gridlocked and stuck in cycles of retribution pride and posturing, in histories of retaliation and long remembered wrongs, aggressive solutions to complex problems, fear of weakness and worship of strength. Lord, have mercy on us. Gentle God of infinitely patient love, forgive us by the love that loosens the bonds teases open the knots and sets us free. Free from the old deadlocks, the imprisoning futilities, the things that hold us captive to our past. Forgive us, Lord, and set us free in our own lives and in our shared life by the gentle power of your love, perfected in the subversive weakness of Christ on the cross that overcomes all things and turns the world upside down. Amen. reading is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 5, verses 1 to 7. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge 
and it shall be devoured. I will break down its walls and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed. Righteousness, but behold, a cry. It isn't just that the image, the figure, or the metaphor of the vineyard is speckled throughout the Old and New Testaments. It's that the vineyard in the first two of our readings today from Isaiah, which we just heard, and then from the Psalms, is more than a figure or metaphor or image. In our reading from Isaiah, it's almost personalized, a character in a drama. The prophet speaks in God's voice as prophets do and tells a story plays out a little dramatic monologue, which is just like those pauses in a play where the audience is suddenly drawn, where we, the audience, are suddenly drawn into the action as one of the central characters comes to the edge of the stage and speaks straight to us. I'm asking you, what do you think? Or in the angst-filled terms of someone in a broken relationship, contemplating terrible new facts, appalled realizations of where a pattern of behavior has led, what am I supposed to do now? What can I do? Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to smash it all up. Everything. I'm going to leave such a total mess. I'm going to vandalize everything we built together. All my hopes, all my plans, everything we were going to do in the future, well, he destroyed that. So everything that symbolizes that now in the present, I'm going to ruin, to tear to shreds. Does that remind you of something? How about those innumerable scenes in films of every kind, from romantic comedies, call them rom-coms and you've named the genre, to tragedies? to soap operas on TV screens, to the small screen, any number of big screen movies, someone who is betrayed and furious, trashing the beloved's flat, ripping up his clothes, paying special attention to, depending on era, smashing up his record collection, unspooling all his cassettes, throwing his CDs, their CDs, the soundtrack of their lives together, into the bin, usually the huge shared one in the back alley. It's the person in a relationship, often the woman, because she is so often in so many human cultures and societies, the one who is made weak, vulnerable, short on options, stripped of power, who opens herself to the huge risk of loving and gets hurt as only those who love and make themselves vulnerable can be hurt. And I'm not making this comparison lightly. That's exactly the position in which God is put in Isaiah's Song of the Vineyard. Rage, futile, destructive rage. Everything that we built together, everything we built our hopes, our expectations of a shared future together on, I'm going to trash it, destroy it. Then I'll feel better, except that I know that I won't. Rage like that is destructive, yet impotent. It's catastrophically destructive because it's impotent. This is God saying, and saying it through the prophet to us, the audience, judge between me and my vineyard. Judge between me and my beloved. What am I supposed to do? I'm stuck. I am full of fury because I am powerless and out of options. And the prophet is implicitly asking us, if things are pushed to the point where God has no options, what do you think happens now? Humanly, the options are exhausted. This is God we're talking about.
restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls, so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it, and all that move in the fields feed on it. Turn again, O God of hosts, look down in heaven and see, have regard for this vine, the stock that your right hand planted. In a way, that psalm is speaking for the vineyard. It's a familiar situation that's depicted in the psalm. We said that the vineyard is a character, both in the Isaiah reading we heard and in that psalm. The vineyard is almost cast as a person, the person in films, TV programs and pop songs who desperately tries not to be swept away in the torrent of justifiable fury and pain and accusation from the one he's wronged and hurt. And when finally the one who's been hurt has nothing more to say and the other party realises that actually he has nothing to say either, no excuse, no defence, no plea in mitigation, there is only begging. So, and we shouldn't dismiss these things as fripperies of entertainment. They are deep cultural expressions of profound and shattering human experiences that human beings understand and relate to. We've moved from the movies to song lyrics like these from the communards. Don't leave me this way. I can't survive. I can't stay alive without your love. Now, we can probably leave out that no baby in the lyrics at that point. But I do find myself wondering whether the Reverend Richard Coles, who, as Wikipedia reminds us, was formerly the multi-instrumentalist who partnered Jimmy Somerville in the 1980s band The Communards, whether he is using these lyrics in his sermon today. If Isaiah's song of the vineyard is the deeply hurt voice of the betrayed beloved, then the psalm you just heard is the pathetic pleading guilty, but trying to say something voice of the party who caused the pain but can't talk about it and simply begs. Can't we put it behind us? Can't we start again? Now, listen up. This is where I jam my minister hat firmly on my head and I say pastorally that nobody should stay in an abusive relationship for any reason whatever. And also where I acknowledge that that's very easy to say and something quite different to do. And please, like that one in the psalm, can often be please to remain in an abusive relationship. Yet this is the point at which we can acknowledge that we've moved beyond the parallels of Isaiah's dramatized parable and the psalm's guilty plea that makes, by the way, no mention of why the vineyard has been ruined, expresses mystification and incomprehension all totally false as to why the flat has been trashed and the relationship seems to be ending. This is the point where we can say without losing any of the meaning that we've unearthed so far that this is not a human love story gone wrong, not a treacherous lover and a betrayed outraged beloved. This is Israel and God. And what the psalm is saying, the way guilty parties often do is, I got us into this me terrible mess. I may have destroyed what we had built together, but only you can get us out of this. Only you can save the relationship. And at that point, that's true. Only God can. Thank you. 
we get into such tangles, don't we? Such fixes, such impasses. Consequences? Well, some of us are better than others at thinking through, at anticipating, at seeing that there are always consequences. Often, when we don't know what the consequences might be, that can be enough to rein us in, to get us to draw back. But there are times when our thinking is wishful, wishful, wishful. If wishing made it so, we say. When someone suggests a wonderful outcome, what if money came your way? What if you were offered your dream job? Oh, we say, if wishing made it so, because we know it doesn't. But sometimes we forget that, and sometimes we say, consequences be blood. So we do the thing we want to do, the thing we can't call back. We find we've committed ourselves to something. Well, we say in our heads, don't we? Stupid, stupid, stupid. And perhaps we hear a reproving parental voice. Don't say that. It isn't nice to call anyone stupid. And the grumpy adolescent in her head says, I was talking to myself. And sometimes, instead of withdrawing from the folly that can't be salvaged, we double down, as the Americans mysteriously say. We brazenly, defiantly, recklessly reinforce what we just did, as though by dint of sheer will we can make the magical thing, our magical thinking conjured up, actually happen. And so we hear the parable Jesus tells, the tenants who beat up the boss's man, kill the next one, try to kill the one after that, and we think, that's insane. Who could ever believe that behaving like that would get you anywhere? And we're comforted because we think, this parable is a million miles away from me. Is it really? The wishful thinking, is that not us sometimes? The pushing and pushing until we have pushed out to that place from which there is only humiliating retreat. The doubling down that makes the whole thing beyond solving, beyond mending. Is that not us sometimes? We get into such tangles, don't we? Such fixes, such impasses. And then we make it worse. Because the other party... The one we are defying so spectacularly, the grumpy official, the policeman who pulled us over, the owner of the vineyard, he's in a fix too, a dreadful fix. Our mad pushing and pushing and doubling down leaves him with no room to manoeuvre either. He has his authority to preserve. He has his status and dignity to maintain. He has his rules, and maybe not just his rules, to uphold. What's he going to do now? We drove him there, and now he's part of the stuckness too. We hear a parable about rebellious tenants and an absent landlord. It was two millennia ago, but strip away the time condition details and it's a human situation we know. We've been there, or somewhere like it, as a spectator, if not a participant. Nobody can back down. Nobody can retreat. Everybody's stuck. Everybody's trapped. I'm reading from Matthew chapter 21, starting at verse 33. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence round it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. 
When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And they said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. This is the only parable that Jesus doesn't finish. He doesn't give a potted pat answer. He turns to his hearers and puts it to them. Now, what do you think must happen? And the deeper question is, what do you think the possibilities are in this situation in which everybody has thrown the options all away? They're not original thinkers, this crowd of Jesus' first hearers. What will he do to them, this affronted landowner with rights, dignity, an image to maintain, and a status quo to uphold? What do you think he'll do to them, Jesus? He'll make them suffer, make them pay. He'll wipe them out, that's what he'll do. But that's the crowd's answer, and it isn't Jesus's. This parable Part of Jesus' point might be that we can sometimes be a bit, or even a lot, like those dream-driven, reality-mocking madmen who think that their plan can work just because it's their plan and they're willing to push it all the way to the end of the road. But Jesus' point certainly isn't that the infuriated landlord, bent on punishment, restitution and vengeance, is anything like God. Someone backed into a corner by human stubbornness and folly so that he has only one violent, destructive course of action open to him. Someone who is so weak, so out of options, that he has no option but violent strength. Does that sound like God to you? And that's really the question this parable puts. And so it is. The experience of Israel is that she gets herself into messes, situations in which she's powerless. And by the time of the prophets, these are messes that are concerned with the way she treats people. The kinds of human relations that she fosters. Abusive, hurtful, degrading. The prophets' preaching is full of denunciations of that kind of thing. And betraying, damaging and hurting people in relationships in that way is betraying, hurting God, say the prophets. And this is what we do. We human beings drive our relationships into impasses. We step back and we wonder what on earth we will do now. Now that our behaviour, our self-centeredness, our disregard of others has got us into a mess we can't get out of. And we realise that we've come to a point in the road, not a fork. The whole point is that there are no more choices, no more possibilities. There is this point which is either a dead end or God. Either no possibility or, as we've said so many times these last weeks, the impossible possibility, which is God. Jesus takes his hearers in this parable right up to the point where the workers in the vineyard have killed the son. And just like Isaiah, Jesus says to his audience, okay, what has to happen now? And they answer him, what do you think? Revenge, destruction, Punishment far worse than trashing a flat or ruining a, ruining a vineyard. Unbridled, self-justifying vengeance. What else can the man do? But the man isn't God. And we all know how the gospel story unfolds. The son comes into the world. God so loves the world. The son is killed. 
But what stems from that isn't the ghastly violence, the boundless retribution that's all we can envisage when we're asked to finish the parable. The only way we can see it ending. All that is taken into God at God's own cost and extinguished. What stems from the death of the Son in the Gospel is reconciliation, grace, mercy, forgiveness and peace. All the things we imagine we've made impossible. But this is God we're talking about.
Let us pray. If all our accomplishments, all our acumen, all our wisdom, our work and our will were to be stripped away, we still belong to you, O God. Therefore, we press onwards towards the goal, not to earn your grace, but to share your love. And so we pray for the twisting of our priorities, for the confusion of our belonging, for the marrying of your image. We are your children. We are your tenants. We are made in your image. May we live up to that reality in our actions and thoughts. And we pray that those in power might seek service over celebrity and work to uplift the poor rather than their popularity. We pray that those without power might find strength in you and partners in us, even when we feel powerless. And we pray for the courage and the strength to press onward. We pray for humility and compassion to transcend the past <coughs> and press forward to what lies ahead, for you are our beginning, you are our present, and you are our destination. As colder nights set in, we remember the countless number of people who sleep on the streets at night. Many are young people whose lives have gone off the rails and whose chaotic lifestyles place them in danger every night of the week. We pray for those who have no place to call home. May they find shelter and provision. We bring to mind those known to us and others who are struggling with a health issue. These struggles can be physical and psychological and at times drive sufferers to despair, even seeking to end their lives. We remember those for whom the nights are the worst when pain seems more intense and worries crowned in on them. We pray for those struggling with their own health or with the care of another. May they know healing, comfort and support. Lord, alert us to those who would welcome a phone call or a friendly word to see them through the day. Help us to be aware of loneliness in our midst and encourage us to respond with generous love and a warm heart. Lord, we pray for those in our communities that are lonely, and may they know your presence. We bring to mind those of our friends who are no longer with us. May we never forget the memories we have of them and all that they mean to us. Keep fresh in our minds the memories that we store of them. For those in our midst who have experienced loss, may they know your comfort. May we as the church be empowered by your spirit to meet need where we find it, bring peace where we gather, show love and compassion to all we meet and love you, Lord, with all our hearts, souls, minds and strength and love others as you have loved us. Hear us too as we join with your church around the world and throughout the ages in saying the words that you first said with your disciples. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, in heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, power and the, the glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. As we left them when we entered this space of worship yet we go back to lives transformed for we go in God we have brought our brokenness into this space of healing our frustration to this place of possibility our penitence to this moment of grace and forgiveness those same lives to which we return are transformed the blessing of God Father Son and Holy Spirit 
be with you now and evermore. Amen.